reunión para, para discutir las unidades de vivienda accesorias. Eh, si usted desea que esta reunión sea traducida al español, por favor, hágamelo saber ahorita. También lo puede escribir en el chat. Eh, y también vamos a tener unas este, sesiones con grupos más pequeños el día de hoy. Entonces también esa se puede interpretar al español. Así es que por favor, hágamelo saber ahora. Muchas gracias. Ok, thank you. Good morning, Tucson. Bill Leonard's here from Portland, rainy Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm your facilitator for the day. I'm really happy to be here to help you with this great project. Thank you for taking the time this morning out of your day to participate in the community meeting. So my job is to help you, help you to support a respectful and productive community discussion about ADUs. So staff has been working for the past six months, listening and taking feedback from the community, and they've developed a draft proposal on how to allow accessory units in Tucson. So they're gonna go through this proposal in some detail, and then there's gonna be plenty of time for your discussion. Um, yeah, so why are we here? Here's the purpose. The builder should understand what they use are and how they can fit your community. To share what staff has heard during the public meeting in February throughout my line costs. Importantly, present a draft, and that's in capital letters, draft, a draft proposal, a work progress based on all this input and extensive discussion by the stakeholder group. So, but most importantly, staff wants to listen to your ideas on how to improve this draft proposal. They have to go back and work on it some more. We also want to, of course, allow opportunity for dialogue with your fellow, fellow, fellow community members and make sure you all understand what the next steps are. So um, there are currently 37 people uh, on this call. Let's see if we could have the next slide, Dan. Um, and so we have put together a, um, a agenda for you. Welcome, background, what we've heard so far, the draft proposal for the ADUs, and then your feedback. There's gonna be about 45 minutes of feedback time. We're gonna have a couple of quick polls. So actually, we're gonna have a poll right before we go into small groups. We're gonna ask you what is important to you about this project. And then at the end, you really wanna stick around at the end because at the end, we're gonna ask everybody on this call as we have on other calls, how uh, important is this project to Tucson? How much do you support it? And then we'll be closing out. So next slide. Okay, we have 37 people. Um, that's a lot, actually 38 right now. So um, you know how Zoom works, you know, we're gonna get everybody to talk. <laughs> so we put together this idea of going into rooms and those rooms will be by your choice. You will go into rooms, pick your topic. And um, so in those rooms, we'd like you to please help each other to let everybody participate by being concise, speaking, uh, allowing others to speak before you speak twice, watch the time limits and use the chat. People are already into the chat, that's great. Chat is a really great part of this thing because you chat with staff while this is going on. Any clarification questions that you have about what's being presented, ask it in chat and they will get right back to you on the answers. And of course, be respectful of others because of course, there are differing viewpoints on this topic, right? And then yes, stay on, on topic. So um, more on that later, but now we'll go to Corin. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And thank you all for being here today uh, to talk about accessory dwelling units in Tucson. So um, again, I'm Corin Manning with Planning and Development Services, uh, Planning Administrator. And I wanna start off by just sharing a little bit about what an accessory dwelling unit is and why we are talking about these types of units, this housing option. Um, so we're kind of all operating from um, the same foundation for this conversation. So an accessory dwelling unit is an independent housing unit with its own kitchen, bathroom, living and sleeping space. The kitchen is a really important piece as we will discuss um, in more detail. 
These units are usually smaller than a primary home. They're typically under a thousand square feet and they are meant to be accessory to a primary residence, meaning it's on the same lot as a primary home. There's a lot of terms you might have heard or be familiar with for these types of units. They're often referred to as casitas, a mother-in-law unit, granny flat, backyard cottage, carriage house. Those are just some of the terms um, you may have heard. Next slide. And there's a lot of different forms accessory dwelling units can take. Um, kind of the most classic example that you might be thinking of is the image in the top left there of the detached accessory dwelling units where it is a freestanding structure separate from the main structure, often in the backyard or a side yard. But they can also be attached to the main house. That could be an addition um, that's put on, or it could be a portion of the house that's been divided and turned into its own units. They can also be an attic or basement that's been converted into an accessory dwelling space. Um, don't see that as often in Tucson um, because of our housing types here, but what we do see is a garage conversion or carport that's been enclosed and converted to an accessory dwelling unit. So those are a few of the different types of ADUs um, that you can see. Next slide. And casitas already exist in Tucson. We have these types of housing units across our city today. Um, there are some cases where these can be built on larger lots. They could also be built as sort of a guest house, which can function similar Similarly to an accessory dwelling unit, we'll get into that in a little more detail when we go through um, zoning, current zoning and the proposal. But you do see these across the city. This is one example, an exterior shot of a existing casita. Um, and you can see this one has access from the alley, can be directly accessed that way. There's also another access point on the other side through the courtyard um, that connects to the main house. So this is an exterior shot. Next slide, you can see um, more an interior view of what these can look like on the inside. These are often um, on the small side, um, again, sometimes five, six, 700 square feet. Um, usually a studio or one bedroom is very common. So um, people make very creative use of space. Um, they're really great for small space living and um, you see a lot of interesting efficiencies as you can see from this image. So that's just a quick um, snapshot of what accessory dwelling units look like outside and inside. Next slide. So why are we talking about accessory dwelling units? Um, why are we looking at this housing option? Um, well, there's a few needs and major goals in our community that these units can help us achieve. So one major need in Tucson is for more affordable housing. Um, everyone on this call is probably aware of the increase in housing costs in the past year, um, in many years previously, but especially in the past year. Um, as the cost of purchasing a home has increased, housing values have increased in our community, making it um, challenging for many households to purchase a home. The cost of uh, rent has also increased across the city. Um, so we see that a lot of households in Tucson are housing cost burdens, meaning they spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs. Over half of renter households, for example, are housing cost burdened. So there's a real need for more affordable housing in our community that is attainable and accessible to um, households in Tucson at the incomes that we see in our community. There's also a need for more housing options for seniors. Like many communities, the population in Tucson is aging. And many people want to be able to age in place, um, stay in the neighborhood where they currently reside, um, or maybe they want to live closer to friends or family who could help with caregiving as they age. Accessory dwelling units are one way people can achieve that, either by maybe moving into a smaller ADU on their property and allowing family members to live into the main house or renting out the main house, um, or um, conversely, staying in a main structure and having friends or family or caregivers live in an accessory dwelling unit. Um, so that's another uh, major goal for our community is housing options for seniors. And then the third kind of overarching theme or goal is climate action and resiliency. Uh, our mayor and council declared a climate emergency in September of last year. And this is a major focus for our community right now is becoming more resilient as our climate changes. 
Accessory dwelling units are one way that we can build on our existing infrastructure and build inward as a city rather than outward. These units are often um, added on already developed lots and in already developed neighborhoods. So they make use of existing infrastructure like the water and sewer infrastructure, our road network and our transit network. Um, so these units are a way of supporting um, housing that can utilize transits and utilize, um, build more walkable neighborhoods, for example. These are also usually smaller footprint homes that tend to be very um, energy efficient. So those are a few of the major goals we have as a community. Accessory dwelling units are one way that we can help um, kind of chip away at some of these goals. It's by no means the only answer on these big complex topics, however. Um, many, we're pursuing many strategies as a community around affordable housing. ADUs are just one piece of that. But we do think they're one piece of the puzzle that can help us achieve some of our goals around housing, becoming a more inclusive community and a more resilient community. Next slide. This project began in November of last year uh, when Mayor and Council, the City of Tucson Mayor and Council initiated this project and directed city staff to begin working on an amendment to our Unified Development Code, which is our zoning code, to allow accessory dwelling units to be built um, across the city and make it easier to build accessory dwelling units. Based on that direction, staff began conducting research, doing a bit of analysis. We've looked at a lot of other cities and communities across the country that have allowed accessory dwelling units. Um, luckily, there's a lot of examples. This, this is something that many communities have utilized in recent years to help address needs for housing and other issues that I just mentioned. Um, so we've been looking at case studies. We've also brought on Opticos Design, a design firm to help us do test fits of different sites and look at how ADUs can fit on existing sites in Tucson. Um, you'll meet some of them um, later today in some of the breakouts if you join that group. And we've also been doing outreach to hear from the community and learn more about our community's goals for accessory dwelling units. Um, we established a stakeholder group based on input from mayor and council. That group includes architects, real estate professionals, housing advocates, neighborhood representatives, um, and others. Um, and it's been a group with diverse perspectives and a place to really hash out some of the issues related to this code amendment. We held a series of public meetings back in February to gather initial input and feedback from the community. And based on uh, what we heard, have developed a proposal that we're here to share with you today. We also have had an online survey open um, and received numerous comments that way. There's also a public review element to this proposal. So we presented this uh, to the Commission on Equitable Housing and Development in April. Um, after we draft a more formal um, code amendment, we will take that to the Planning Commission in a study session that we're targeting for late June. The Planning Commission also holds a public hearing. We're aiming for late July for that public hearing on this item. And then Mayor and Council would also hold a public hearing when they consider any code amendment um, to the Unified Development Code. So there will be numerous other opportunities for public comment and input along the way. Next slide. So a little more about the input that we've received so far. I mentioned the public meetings that we held in February. We held three virtual meetings just like this over Zoom. We had about 200 people attend. Um, we also had an online survey and received 77 online comments. 39 of those comments were more concerned, expressing um, concern and some suggestions about how to um, craft this code amendment. 37 were supportive of accessory dwelling units. We also established a stakeholder group, as I mentioned, and you'll, you'll hear from a member of that group in just a minute. There's 40 members of that group and they've held six meetings over the past six months. Next slide. So a little more about what we heard in February at our first round of public meetings. We asked people how they think accessory dwelling units could benefit their neighborhood or family. And we heard a lot about how accessory dwelling units can meet affordable housing needs, support seniors who wish to age in place, provide more options for multi-generational housing and family support, um, be a source of income and financial stability for homeowners as well as for the broader community, support neighborhood stability and diversity of housing types um, as a form of infill development that reduces sprawl and supports climate solutions, 
and we heard a desire to regulate and improve existing accessory dwelling units or casitas across the city. Next slide. We also asked people about any concerns they have and heard um, some concerns about the impact of rental housing, about student housing and mini dorms, short-term rentals, parking, traffic, um, privacy and neighborhood safety, property values, taxes, potential for speculation, uh, the impact on affordability, the cost to develop an ABU, specifics of the proposed regulations, enforcement, monitoring, sustainability and heat island effect, and uh, historic standards and neighborhood character. Next slide. And then we asked people, what are some ways those concerns could be addressed? Um, and got some great ideas on um, how to craft appropriate regulations with respect to the ADU size, lot size setbacks, um, providing financial assistance to ensure affordability, uh, developing model plans and expedited permitting, occupancy requirements, parking requirements, utility meters, enforcement, neighborhood-based regulations and review, and sustainability incentives were some of the ideas that people shared. Next slide. So we also have had an online survey open for the past um, about two months. And we received a lot of comments that way. We kind of divided the comments into those expressing concern and those that were supportive. Although of course, within those categories, there's a lot of variation in different levels of support expressed. Um, this is a word cloud showing you some of the topics that came up in the concerned comments. So some of the, the things that people expressed related to historic preservation, absentee landlords, the heat island effect, student housing, affordability, and parking. Those were some of the key issues um, people mentioned. Next slide. And here's a snapshot of the supportive comments that we received. People mentioned housing supply, elderly parents, affordability, um, having space for family, density, and sustainability. So this gives you a, a quick snapshot into some of the things we heard. One thing to note is that at the center of both of these word clouds was affordability. So affordable housing is really a key concern, I think, um, across the board in our community. So we'll talk a little bit more about affordable housing and ADU, how ADUs fit into that picture in just a minute. Next slide. Um, but before we do that, I want to invite a member of the stakeholder group to say a little bit about the process that that group has gone through um, in their discussions about accessory dwelling units. So Corky, do you want to share a little bit? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Corin. Uh, my name is Corky Poster. I'm an architect and planner. Um, been practicing in Tucson for 47 years. Uh, and my firm, Poster Merton McDonald, has specialized in affordable housing. Most of that housing about 4,000 units has been institutional affordable housing of various types through various HUD programs or IRS programs. Uh, I got involved in the ADU conversation over the last six months as a result of a conference that was put on last fall. Uh, Jim Murphy, I think, is on the call today. I was one of the organizers about that of that conference, and it really discussed the issue of affordable housing for older adults. Uh, and what's interesting to me and the reason I've been active in the stakeholder group is that um, ADUs are, are a more natural type of affordable housing, less institutional and uh, more natural in terms of how it's organized. Uh, I've been impressed with the process that's been organized by uh, uh, planning and development services. I uh, participated in all six of the stakeholder meetings, all of the online meetings, and uh, now this is the fourth meeting that I've attended in the last, uh, uh, in the last week or so. Um, I think it'd be useful if I just mentioned very briefly uh, my experience with an ADU. Uh, the very first one that Corin showed, the yellow one, uh, I built in 1990 uh, for my mother when my father passed away. Uh, she lived with us um, for 11 years, helped us raise our children. It was great for her. It was great for us. It was great for our children. Uh, and that intergenerational experience was um, one of the best things that's ever happened in my, my life. We didn't charge her rent because she didn't charge me rent when I was growing up. Um, and then when she stopped uh, renting, she stopped living there. 
Uh, we had a graduate student who lived there for five years paying $400 a month rent. Uh, and then since then, we've used it as kind of an, of an emergency housing option for friends who got divorced or a friend whose a car drove into her living room in her house and needed to be rebuilt. And, um, and occasionally asylum seekers that have, uh, have lived there for a few days at a time. So it's really functioned for us as a very comfortable and easy um, affordable housing alternative for a variety of uh, friends and family and, uh, and groups um, related to that. Um, so I'm a strong proponent of ADU. Uh, I've been involved uh, throughout this very open and, uh, and, and detailed process. And I've mostly been, been impressed by the ability of staff to listen to what was being said at those meetings and continually modify uh, the draft uh, report uh, so that it really represented um, what the proponents were looking for, but also the concerns that uh, were being expressed by uh, other folks on the call. So thanks, Corin, for that opportunity. Thank you, Corky. Appreciate that. Um, so you can see the goals that the stakeholder group has prioritized for this code amendment. Um, it really speaks to what we heard at the public meetings and in other through other avenues. Um, so the goals of increasing the supply of affordable housing, encouraging more flexible housing options for seniors, supporting multi-generational households, supporting climate resilient and sustainable infill development, providing supplemental income to landowners and promoting economic stability, allowing diverse and flexible housing options within neighborhoods and promoting mixed income communities, allowing and permitting a housing style that already exists in our community and providing legal avenues for upgrades and retaining neighborhood character. Uh, next slide. So um, we could see on those word clouds that affordability was really a key goal and for a lot of people a question um, about ADUs. This is one of the big issues that our city is grappling with right now. So I wanna say a little bit more about how accessory dwelling units can help, can provide affordable housing um, and can be one piece of our um, strategies to promote affordable housing. So for one, accessory dwelling units add to the supply of housing for our community, just increasing the housing stock in general that we have. Um, we also see through research that's been conducted that market rate accessory dwelling units tend to rent for less than is typical for the neighborhood where an ADU is located meaning that an accessory dwelling unit located in uh, maybe a higher cost neighborhood, um, a high opportunity neighborhood, um, rents for less than other housing options in that neighborhood typically. And that's one way because these tend to be smaller units um, and um, just sort of mixed in with maybe larger homes, um, they can be rented for less than is typical. So this is one way of promoting more mixed income neighborhoods. It provides more diversity of housing types that can be accessible to households at different income levels. Um, we also see that um, these are smaller units typically, which means they can be lower cost to rent. They usually don't have all the um, amenities of you know, a new apartment building. There's not an on-site gym and things like that. Um, so they're usually just lower cost to rent on the market. Um, in many communities, um, there are programs to, um, use subsidies or incentives to promote the development of ADUs um, that are rented to lower cost, lower income households through programs using Section 8 vouchers or other means. And this is something that um, we're beginning to pursue here in Tucson. And then um, accessory dwelling units are also part of making home ownership more affordable and attainable for some households. So these units can provide additional income for a homeowner um, making home ownership more sustainable for them and promoting neighborhood stability if someone is now able to remain in a neighborhood um, with that additional income from an ADU. And then lastly, and this is an uh, important piece about accessory dwelling units that's a little different than other housing um, that's on the market, which is that accessory dwelling units are often not rented on our market. Instead, they serve as housing for family members or friends. Um, so they're a way of supporting multi-generational households or intergenerational households um, and can be a way of combining resources, pooling resources as a family um, 
and providing caregiving, which could be for elder care or it could be childcare. Um, so that ADU could factor into lowering your cost of childcare as a family if you now have aunts or grandparents on site who can help out in that way. So there's a lot of different ways that accessory dwelling units help um, create more affordable housing and promote um, community stability. All right, with that, um, I want to turn it over to Dan, who's going to walk us through the proposal for accessory dwelling units in Tucson. Excellent. Thank you, Corin. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. I'm Dan Bursick. I am a uh, principal planner with uh, Planning and Development Services, work on code amendments and things of that sort. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is allowed today um, related to zoning codes, and um, then it'll kind of frame what we're doing for the proposal. So currently, there are two types of um, two types of housing units that are very similar to accessory dwelling units, but don't quite meet the criteria that Corin talked about previously. So um, one is the sleeping quarters. Um, so sleeping quarters are currently allowed um, for most zoning code. Um, they are allowed on any residentially zoned parcel with a residential use. Um, its size is limited to 50% of the size of the principal structure, so the main structure on the, on the, the lot. Um, they are allowed um, to have a kitchenette, uh, but not a full kitchen. So they can have a mini fridge and a microwave. They cannot have a range um, and a full fridge, essentially. Um, there is no additional parking required for these, um, and the max building height of these is 12 feet unless attached to a principal structure. And as you can, can imagine, it really does, the size of these depends a lot on um, the size of the principal structure. If you have a 2,000 square foot structure, it could be 1,000 square feet. If you have an 800 square foot structure, it would have to be 400 or less. Um, we also have second residential units. So um, these are allowed in R1, R2, and R3 zones, um, but it's really dependent on how large your lot is. So an R1 parcel of, 10, of greater than 10,000 feet can have a second unit, R2 greater than 5,808 square feet, and then R3 1,210 square feet. Um, there is no size limit on these. Um, however, 25%, there needs to be a 25% difference between the primary structure and R1. Um, and either can be the primary structure. Uh, for example, um, so I live on a lot in the R1 zone, for, and our house is 1,400 square feet. I can build a 2,000 square foot lot uh, unit on my lot out in the backyard if I need, if I wanted to, or or larger as long as it met all of the zoning conditions. Um, it is allowed to have a full kitchen. Um, it does need to be parked per our zoning code and what would normally um, be required. Um, and the max building height is the same as whatever's allowed for the zone. Um, for that. So uh, it could be, you know, in a lot of zones, it's 25 feet, essentially. Um, what we're looking at with the ADU or for accessory dwelling units is really something that kind of fits in between these. It hits that sweet spot between the sleeping quarters and the second residential unit. So um, related to the draft proposal, um, so the, the, what we're looking at here, and this is kind of a depiction of, of what it is, is looking at a thousand square foot maximum size for your ADU. It can be 700 square feet or 800 or 300, um, but it allows for um, enough space to have two bedroom units, um, but not so large that it would really allow for more than that. Um, the smaller size we believe uh, limits that impact on neighborhood and surrounding property um, that you, you do see sometimes. Um, and it's more simple for applicants to understand and staff to administer by having the flat rate instead of the percentage kind of similar to what we had for the, we have for the sleeping quarters. Um, so that thousand square feet would be what we're looking at related to this. And this is our proposal as of now. Um, related to setbacks and development standards um, for, for, these, uh, for these units, uh, we're not looking at, uh, we're not at, at this point proposing any changes to our setbacks, uh, maximum building height, maximum lot coverage. Um, those would all be dependent on whatever your zone is essentially. Um, the reason for this is we went through and actually did an analysis of different parcels throughout the city. So we looked at parcels kind of in the center city area or the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, we looked at Midtown, we looked at the east side um, and did a bunch of different scenarios. And we found that um, on most lots, you can really fit an ADU within the existing setbacks. Uh, we do have a current process that we already have, which is our design development option that does provide an avenue for reduced setbacks. Uh, it's on a site-by-site -site basis. Um, 
What's nice about this is that it has a uh, notification of the surrounding properties where it allows you to actually comment on, on whether or not uh, on the proposal. Um, and then we can put site specific conditions on there to help mitigate some of those issues that could happen if you were to reduce some of those setbacks. Um, so that's what we're looking at for setbacks and, and development standards. Um, building standards, uh, just kind of want to touch base on this to kind of clarify a couple things. One is that um, this is not the tiny home on wheels type thing. Um, this is must, an ADU accessory dwelling unit must be built on a permanent foundation um, and meet building code that way. Um, additionally, there was some concern in our stakeholder groups and some of our public meetings related to accessibility for, um, for seniors, and especially if you know, we're kind of looking to try to help seniors in senior housing and for that type of thing. Um, and one of the things that, that it would have to adhere to is um, this uh, inclusive home design ordinance that was passed in 2007. Um, so it would have to have things like zero grab, zero grab entry, uh, grab bar, zero step entry, sorry, uh, grab bars, um, accessible entrances, doorways, and things of that sort. Um, so it would be required to meet those standards. Um, so where can you, where can you build an, an accessory dwelling unit? So um, what we're looking at here is that all lots, um, single family or two family residents, as you see in the picture there, there's a duplex and a single family, um, would be allowed to add one accessory dwelling unit. Um, we would look at for existing homes in newer subdivisions, uh, single family residents may have one ADU, but they need to make sure that they meet those lot coverage requirements of the zone. So it needs to fit on the lot. Um, and then we're looking at new construction and subdivisions and how we could potentially allow for this. Um, it's a little more challenging when you start having full subdivisions and that type of thing. So we are looking at that um, uh, moving forward. But those are, that's essentially what we're looking at for our proposal uh, for where you can put these. Um, uh, related to privacy mitigation and historic design standards, this was a concern that we've heard quite a bit from, um, from some of the people in our stakeholder group as well as the public just related to, um, we have these existing historic preservation zones and neighborhood preservation zones that have design standards and a review process. Um, for this, uh, we will continue to be applied in those areas that have those historic preservation zones and neighborhood preservation zones. So they would, they, they, they would not be affected by this essentially. You would have to go through those reviews. Um, one thing we do wanna note is that additionally, um, there is the group dwelling ordinance that will remain in place and will not be affected by this. Everyone would have to adhere to that as well. Um, related to parking um, and uh, related to our draft proposal for parking, we're looking at something, this is kind of in between uh, what's existing, the secondary unit and the, uh, and the sleeping quarters, but also kind of, a, kind, of a, a, kind of a middle ground that we had from our stakeholder group. So we're looking at one parking space would be required per accessory dwelling unit. Um, and then the requirement may be satisfied through on-site or on-street parking. Um, on street parking could utilize the city's parking permit program. We've been in contact with uh, Park Tucson and the people who run that to, uh, to kind of, you know, to, to let them know and kind of work through some of those issues that may come up related to that. Um, and then parking requirement could be waived based on proximity to transit or bike boulevards. Um, and then parking may be accessed from alleys per UDC regulation. So there's a UDC regulation related to alleys um, that has criteria for when you would be able to actually park off of that alley. Um, it would be, um, it would be uh, like 20 feet wide, the alley would have to be, it'd have to have some sort of uh, kind of dust mitigation, um, and there's accessibility standards uh, related to that. Um, we do want to note on this that there's no change to the parking requirements for sites with five plus bedrooms in R1 zones. Um, basically what happens in R1 zones after you get over five, it's one um, spot per bedroom. So um, we aren't looking to have any changes related to that. Um, Owner occupancy and ADU owner occupancy. Uh, we are not proposing a, uh, an owner occupancy requirement related to this. Um, however, the occupancy of the ADU must comply with group dwelling regulations. Um, there are several reasons for this. We've had quite a bit of a discussion with our stakeholder group, with our public meetings. Um, it's just, uh, and looking at other communities, uh, enforcement of these owner occupancy requirements is incredibly difficult. Um, we, uh, we actually went and met, uh, talked to people in Flagstaff. Um, who have an owner occupancy regulation, um, and it's incredibly uh, in it's it's uh, resource intensive um, to keep track of that, and it's very difficult to understand like whether or not someone's actually adhering to it. What we found is that the the communities that do have this, um, and there's we've only seen a handful of them, they tend to be smaller communities like Flagstaff and Durango. 
Um, another issue related to this is that owner occupancy relate, uh, requirements make it really challenging for homeowners to sell their property. So, um, so if you were, you know, to have to move or something of that sort, it, it does make it very difficult as you do a deed restriction related to owner occupancy. Um, we do want to notice, uh, mention, we, did, we uh, just related to um, short-term rentals. We know this has been an issue, um, but uh, one of the reasons why we're not, you know, proposing any any restrictions on short-term rentals is that we're restricted at a state level. Um, the state does not allow us to really. Um, have regulations related to short term rentals. Um, this is something that if it does change at the state level, you know, we could look into, but as of now, we are severely limited on what we can do for things like Airbnb and VRBO and things of that sort. Um, so uh, related to sustainability, this was a, a big topic. Um, people were concerned, and there was a little bit of chat related to the urban heat island effect. Um, people were concerned that as you, um, as you build on some of these lots and add in some infill, um, which what we've seen in other communities with AUs, it is dispersed um, throughout, but it's not you know, necessarily clustered, but it still is increasing impervious surface um, in some of these lots. And there was concern about you know, the urban heat island effect on some of these communities. So we actually um, went and talked to professors at University of Arizona to kind of get an understanding of what that impact was. Um, what they kind of came back to us with was that you know, generally this level of density at smaller scale doesn't have a very large effect. Um, and then they pointed us to a study that was done on Savano, which is a community on the east side um, that's kind of a new urbanist community. And um, basically their requirement for, um, for cool roofs and white and uh, white colored roofs, um, they looked at the, the, that neighborhood compared to one immediately below that didn't have the requirement. And it effectively really mitigated a lot of the, 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 the heat island effect in that community. So what we're looking at doing here is to, um, is to have a requirement for new construction to have a cool roof. Um, we're looking at something that's a little more, that's, that doesn't really mess, uh, affect the affordability too much. So it could be just painting your roof, your roof white, um, but it could also be using things like uh, cool shingles. I'm actually putting a new roof on my house this week and it will have those cool shingles. Um, and things of that sort that, that are listed in the building code. Um, one um, additional thing that we, we do wanna mention here just related to this is that projects, new projects must meet the current energy code as well. Um, current building standards and they continue to get more and more uh, strict um, are much more um, uh, sustainable and much more um, energy efficient uh, now than they were even just 10 years ago. So they will have to meet all of those standards um, for new construction related to this. And then finally, just kind of related to sustainability and, 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 and ADUs, I mean, it is really um, just naturally sustainable. So as Corin was talking about earlier, related to climate change and things of that sort, increasing density, supporting transit, um, diverting new development from, um, from the periphery and sprawl, um, those are all things that that just naturally ADUs do help with um, related to climate change and sustainability. Um, so a summary of the proposal, just kind of related to this. Um, so uh, 1,000 square feet maximum ADU size, uh, one ADU allowed per residential lot, um, one parking space required per ADU with reductions for transit access and use of on-street parking, no owner occupancy requirement, existing height lots, uh, coverage and setback standards do apply, and then a cool roof uh, required. Um, so uh, we understand that there's only really a there's a limit on what um, you know zoning regulations can do. So um, in addition to the kind of proposal related just the zoning code, um, we do have some other kind of what we're calling ADU supportive programs. Um, so one of those, and this is something that's been brought up a lot, is just a lot of these unpermitted um, structures that we have in the community, as well as people that have developed um, sleeping quarters. So we're looking at an amnesty program, and this has been done in other communities. Durango is uh, notorious, uh, has, has a very, has a program related to this that's worked very well. Um, and looking at an amnesty program for unpermitted guest houses, as well as um, people who want to take those sleeping quarters and maybe add a kitchen to them. So um, this is something we've had a discussion with our stakeholder group. It would be a set period of time. Um, we're looking at things such as you know, uh, inspections to make sure that they meet health, life, and safety um, in order to kind of allow for those to come into conformance with the code. 
Um, additionally, um, right now we're charging uh, twice the permitting fees uh, in order to bring people up to code um, and come and get it permitted. Um, we're looking at potential reductions of those fees related to that. Um, another kind of uh, subject related to this that you know, ADU supportive programs have um, just related to affordable housing. Um, so we're looking at programs that would have to support some of those affordable housing um, things that maybe aren't totally addressed through the zoning code. Um, those would be like partnerships to provide technical assistance, um, developing model plans that can be used to bring down costs. Um, that's something, you know, having a design competition related to that. And then people come in with a pre-approved plan, so they don't have to hire an architect. Um, or exploring local funding um, kind of options to help provide financial assistance. So those are some of the things we're looking at. Um, really appreciate you coming. And uh, now we're going to uh, pass this over to Bill and we're going to um, have a poll and some breakout groups. Okay, Dan, thanks for that great summary. Um, we're going to do two polls, uh, one now and one after our breakout groups. So Corin, if you could uh, get the first poll up. Okay. What aspects of what you heard, this draft proposal, do you think needs refinement? Where should staff devote their time in working on the next draft? So just get up there and pick whichever one you think is most important. And we'll uh, populate the poll and have Corin uh, end it when you get everybody up. Yes, votes are coming in. 58% voted. People another couple seconds. All right, we're at over 80%. So I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Right, so it's almost a tie between size standards and affordability. After that, parking, sustainability, occupancy, and others. Uh, others, please, yeah, put that in the chat. Uh, good job on the chat, everybody. That's a really great way for you to get your clarification questions answered immediately, almost, by staff. So keep it up. Now we're going to go to breakout groups. Um, so look at these five categories here. These are going to be five different groups. We want you to first pick the first one you want to go to and then the second one you want to go to. So your first and second choice. You're going to have, we're going to have two rounds. So um, pick your first and second choice there. Now, the way this works is first, in terms of breakout groups, this is how you do it. If you don't see a pop-up screen that pops up and renounces the breakout groups, for most computers, go down to the bottom of your screen and look to the right there. There's this tabs called breakout groups, a, a button. It's like little four squares. There you go. See that breakout group there? And that should take you to a list of the breakout groups. Then look at the one you want, like parking, and go to the right. And actually, what you'll see is a number. Click on that number, and you'll see the Join button. You can join it. If that all fails, then let Dan know, and he will put you in a room personally. So either chat it to Dan or just call them out and say, Dan, this ain't working for me. Put me in group parking. OK? So everybody try that. Let's get going and uh, see how it goes. Anybody who's stuck, ask Dan to help you. Once we get the rooms populated, you'll go there, and there'll be a facilitator and recorder in each room. We're going to go round robin and uh, 20 minutes on one, and we'll flip. You'll choose another room 20 minutes on the other. If there happens to be more than 20 people in a room, I'm going to ask facilitators to have people go to the second choice to make sure it's no more than 20, because that's kind of hard to handle. OK, let's go. Dan, are you helping people get into the rooms now? Uh, yes, I am. OK, good. This is usually what happens. Some yeah. people need a little help. That's fine. That's why we're here. Okay. And oh, 
by the way, there, uh, sorry, there is the Spanish speaking room. Sorry to mention that, I forgot to mention it. If you'd like to go to the Spanish speaking room, that room will pick its own topics and you'll be able to speak in Spanish. Okay, it looks like we have a few more. Um... Okay, facilitators, just get going in your room, have people uh, introduce themselves while people are coming in. All right, Arlen, uh, where, would you, where would you like to go? Sounds good, I'll put you right there. Hey, Dan. Hey, Chris, how are you doing? Good. Can you put me in cost and affordability? Most definitely. I'll put you there right now. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Looks like we have uh, a Beth and John. Can I give you a hand to moving you to a, uh, uh, a room? Yes. Uh, John here. Uh, uh, Dan, can you put me in ADU size and site consideration, please? Most, most definitely. You Thank you. Right now, you're welcome. All right, and it looks like I Dan, have Dan. Yeah. This is Beth. Hi, Beth. Put me in affordability, please. Will do. Dan, this is Kenneth. Would you put me in parking, please? Yeah, most definitely. It's strange that it didn't. I will do it right now. There you go. Hopefully that works. Let me. There we go. Okay. There's a bunch of people in affordability. I, I well, they're all in affordability and ADU size. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit here for a second and see if anybody else shows up. Sometimes people drop in here and I can't get back to this room. Um, mm -hmm. But then I'll I'll probably jump in affordability or ADU size and kind of see how that's going. Yeah, I'll go to affordability right now. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Maria. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we're all coming back to the main room. That's always a bit jarring when you're, it's like uh, Star Trek or something, you're being transported into another space, right? <laughs> um, we're gonna get ready to do our final poll. So uh, Dan, you wanna let us know when we're ready to do that? Sure, I think uh, Corin got it set up, so let's see. Yeah, I think we have most people back here. So most thank you everyone back. for your comments and um, feedback in the breakout rooms. So let's do one final poll. Just a sec. Okay, how do you feel this proposal will benefit your community? Vote now. This has been done in every meeting we've had. And as Karin will explain, a similar poll will be available online. Right, we have 90% so, voted. Excellent. Yeah, now I, uh, so keep using the chat. The chat has been very useful, uh, especially if you disagree in any way, uh, let them know why. Why do you disagree? Let staff know that in the chat or email them or something. Okay, about there, Corin. Yep, so here are our results. Folks should be able to see the results on your screen. So we got 90% um, of participants voted. So thank you for sharing and looks like there's pretty strong support. Um, and some folks were neutral, um, maybe not sure, and um, a few that disagree. But overall, it looks like um, a lot of support for the proposal. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, there are actually no additional meetings, I apologize. <laughs> um, but as far as the next steps go for the process, we really appreciate you coming out. Um, we are going to um, post the recording of these meetings uh, to our website. I just put the link up in the chat if you'd like um, with a summary of the comments um, to the project website in the next week or so. Um, we plan to review the feedback received today and the other meetings uh, with our stakeholder group, um, integrate this into our proposal. Um, we did create an additional online poll that is uh, linked onto our website right now. So you can go on there and you can fill out the poll. Um, it has an open-ended comment section as well, if you'd like, so you can put your additional comments in there. Um, we will be developing the draft zoning text and, and distributing that, um, and then eventually going through the, uh, the, fine, the kind of formal process, which is planning commission study session, uh, the public hearing, and then ultimately uh, public hearing with our mayor and council uh, for their consideration. So um, with that, uh, we really wanna thank you for your attendance and participation. We really appreciate it. And uh, we uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for participating today. Take care. Well done Tucson. <laughs>